as you probably, many of you know, I had this uh, tweet storm that I put up a few days back, or almost a week back, and it went insanely viral. So I figured that's a topic that everybody would want to talk about. Um, and the topic is, of course, how to get rich, which I thought would be a really crass topic that people would just sort of attack me. And I think it would, it would be very popular. Uh, but uh, it turns out to be a very popular topic. Everybody wants to make money. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, we, we live in a difficult society where everybody pretends like they uh, don't want to make money. But in the reality is everybody does want to make money because it can uh, really help out, uh, you know, with all your material possessions. Um, okay, anyway, that's enough for, uh, <laughs> that's enough on the feedback on the audio, otherwise I'm not gonna talk much. All right, so we're gonna talk about the tweet storm, uh, about how to make money. Uh, the, the bad lighting was deliberate, and I'm doing you a favor with the bad lighting, trust me on that, you don't, you don't want the good lighting. Um, yeah, money uh, buys you freedom in the material world. It, it's not going to make you happy. Uh, it's not going to, uh, you know, solve necessarily your health problems. It's not going to make your family great. It's not going to make you fit. Uh, it's not going to make you calm, but it will solve a lot of your external problems. And so uh, I think it's a reasonable step to go ahead and make money. So uh, I, you know, I grew up uh, poor and miserable and uh, I learn how to make money and be happy. And so those are the two things that I think like I have some insight on. So I would like to be able to communicate that to people who are interested to the extent that it helps them. And of course, one of the problems with talking about this stuff in social media is that uh, there are a lot of people who are really attached to not making money or who are really attached to not being happy. And so it's very difficult to talk about these topics because uh, those people uh, don't want to feel bad about their choices. And so they feel the need to sort of try to shut down these conversations. Uh, or sometimes they try to, uh, you know, gain status by attacking people who are, who are trying, to, trying to talk about these topics. Uh, but they're important topics because uh, these are not zero sum games. These are positive sum games. Everybody in the world can be happy. Everybody in the world can be wealthy. And I think that it's, it's just a matter of education, know-how and effort. Uh, so, you know, these are, these are worthwhile things to work on. And if someone doesn't want to make money and if someone doesn't want to be happy, then you don't belong here. Um, so I'm sorry that you decide not to do that. Hey, whoever's talking about Elon getting attacked, I'm going to block you. So, uh, if you're going off topic, someone keeps going off topic, uh, that's, uh, that's out. Okay, great. So, uh, we're, we're trying to have a civil conversation here. So if people start just kind of jumping in with all caps, then we have to unfortunately remove them. It's, uh, you know, they're uh, bad audience members. All right, so we're gonna to talk today about making money. Uh, and, uh, you know, firstly, uh, I'm gonna go through the, the tweet storm itself. That tweet storm, by the way, was about 40 tweets. And uh, I actually had close to 100. So there were a large number of them that I just left on the cutting room floor. Uh, because I thought they were a little bit off topic or they wouldn't make for as coherent or cogent of an argument. But obviously, how to make money is a very deep topic. Uh, it's one that we can talk about for hours and days. So, um, oh, someone's saying I can deactivate comments. That's interesting. Uh, I'll leave them on for now, but if they get really annoying, I'll block people uh, or I'll just delete them. Uh, I could read out all 100 tweets, but they're not in order, so it, it wouldn't be coherent. Uh, and a lot of it wouldn't make sense. Uh, part of the uh, part part of what I did was I tried to create a message that uh, would be easily packaged. And frankly, forty tweets is already too many. Um, if you notice that tweet storm, by the way, for those of you who uh, are active on Twitter, uh, there were a couple of things about that tweet storm that were uh, uh, that were very deliberately crafted. Uh, I didn't have tweet numbers. So I didn't say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, because that would make it harder to spread individual tweets from the tweet storm. It also makes it feel more mechanical and less timeless. Uh, a second thing that I did very deliberately uh, is each tweet is written so that it makes sense standalone. So if you have no context of who I am or what I'm talking about, and you see a single one of those tweets show up in your feed, it still makes sense. So what that means is, it makes the entire tweet storm yeah, randomly accessible. 
Uh, and so it makes the whole thing very viral. They're independent standalone tweets. Uh, so to the people out there who are translating them, I encourage you to keep the one tweet per, uh, one translation of each tweet per tweet format uh, and not try to bundle like four tweets into one translation tweet. Uh, and also to not add numbers to it because it actually lowers the spread vector, lowers the virality. Um, so yeah, for those of you who are who are having bad audio, I'm sorry, it's either that or no audio. So we can just not do this. That's unfortunately my only other option, but I promise you for the next one, I will get a lavalier mic. I'll get the best one money could buy and we're gonna have great sound. So it's like Trump says, you're gonna love the sound. But right now you just gotta deal with what we have. So, um, so let's talk about the different tweets and the different concepts. Yeah, first is how long does it take to make money? <laughs> it takes decades. It's going to take longer than you would like. But, uh, you know, the best time to start was yesterday. The second best time is now. So you may as well start if, you're, if it's something you're thinking about. Uh, it's fine to start working on it now. And uh, it, it may take a while for it to pay out. Uh, but when it does start paying out, you will essentially have uh, it, it's not that you will have made money, but you will have become the kind of person that makes money. And once you're the kind of person that makes money and you have some comfort around that, then you essentially have your freedom. Um, so you're, you're basically going to learn the skills and how to make money. You're going to become a money-making machine. And once you're a money-making machine, the goal is that 10 or 20 years from now that you will get hit by a tsunami of money and you will know how it's coming at you. Yeah, by the way, there's some people in the threads who are talking about crypto. Yes, if you were in crypto at the right time, you made a bunch of money. But to even be in crypto at the right time required you to be a certain kind of person who was more amenable to making money. For example, to make money in crypto, it helped to have had a love of the technology early on. It helped to be uh, a quick learner. Uh, it helped to already have some capital put away. It helped to know what kinds of risks are worth taking and which ones aren't. Um, so let me ask a, answer a question that I keep coming up. Does this only apply to the US? You know, some of it, sure. Like if you want to be a technology business and you don't live in a technology hub, that's difficult. But on the other hand, some of these principles are timeless. Uh, for example, uh, owning equity in a business being the only real path towards making money over time. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that applies across the board. Compound interest, that applies across the board. Um, let me start off with uh, just talking about uh, ownership versus uh, wage work. Um, so if, if you are getting paid uh, for renting out your time, and that even includes lawyers and includes uh, doctors, you can make some money. Uh, you're just not gonna make the kind of money that uh, gives you your financial freedom. You're not gonna have passive income where uh, business is earning for you while you sleep and while you are on vacation. So uh, when you own equity in a company, that basically means you own the upside. When you own debt, you own guaranteed revenue streams and you own the downside. Uh, you wanna own equity. If you don't own equity in a business, uh, then I think your, your odds of making money are very slim. So you have to kind of walk up to the point where you can own equity in a business. And you can own equity as a small shareholder where you've bought stock, but you can also own it as an owner where you started the company. Um, so ownership is really important. Um, by the way, as an aside, I, I did tweet out a little addendum to the thread, which most people missed, but if you can only remember two words, two words, I'm gonna give you the whole tweet storm in two words now, if you're paying attention. And these are very important. Both words are loaded. And because I have to compress them down to two words, you have to get it precisely. But anytime you are trying to figure out what to do, think of these two words, productize yourself. Okay, so basically, not product of yourself, productize yourself. What you're going to do is you're going to create a product out of whatever it is that you naturally and uniquely do really, really well, okay? Of course, you have to read the tweet storm to understand what those two words mean to get a lot of concept, context, but just those two, you can carry those in your heads. Productize yourself. 
you're building a product. That product is a set of things that you uniquely know how to do, that hopefully society wants, that you can leverage and scale up. But products by their nature are leveraged. Products by their nature are scaled up. And yourself means that you don't get to compete at being somebody else. Because if you compete at being somebody else, you are not going to be the best in the world at it. And if you're not the best in the world at it, you will not get rewarded properly for it. So yes, it's how you package yourself in a product. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, it, it's hard. This is why I say it, it takes decades, not just because it just takes decades to execute, but the better part of a decade may just be, uh, just may just be used figuring out what it is that you can uniquely provide. Um, so I'm going to get now to compound interest and specific knowledge. I think compound interest comes up a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, specific knowledge is also something that I think is a, is a difficult concept to wrap your head around. So let's talk about compound interest. Compound interest, most of you should know it in the finance context. If you don't, then you know, crack open a microeconomics textbook. It's worth reading microeconomics textbook through from uh, you know, start to finish. Uh, macroeconomics, you can skip for the most part. Uh, as Nassim Taleb says, it is much easier to macro bullshit than it is to micro bullshit. So with macroeconomics, there's just so much politics that bleeds into macroeconomics, especially once you're beyond the basics of supply and demand, that it's very hard to tell when you're reading politics with a little bit of mathematics around it and when you're actually reading something that's more fundamental. Um, so compound interest is basically the idea that, let's say if you're earning 10% a year, the first year, you make 10% and you end up with, let's say you had a dollar you invested, you end up with $1.10. But the next year, you end up with $1.21. And the next year, you end up with $1.32 or 33 So it keeps adding on itself in such a way that if you're compounding at 30% a year for 30 years, you don't just end up with you know 10 or 20 times your money, you end up with thousands of times your money. So compound interest is a very powerful concept. But compound interest applies to more than just compounding capital. Uh, compounding capital... Uh, is just is, is just the beginning. Compounding business relationships is very important. If you look at some of the top roles in society, like why does someone get to be a CEO of a public company or be on the board of a public company, or why does someone get to be a banker who's managing a billion dollars, is because people trust them. And they trust them because the relationship in which they've worked, the work that they've done, it's kind of compounded. They've stuck with the business and they've shown themselves in a visible and accountable way to be high integrity people. So compound interest can also happen in your reputation. If you have a sterling reputation and you do a good job with it and you keep doing that for decades upon decades, people will notice that and your reputation will literally end up being thousands to tens of thousands of times as valuable as somebody else who is actually very talented but is not keeping a, a kind of a compound interest game and reputation going. Um, this is also true when you're working with uh, individual people. So if you've worked with somebody at, at, in a business where they're your coworker and you work together for five or 10 years and you still enjoy working with them, obviously you trust them. The little foibles are gone. All the negotiations that normally would happen in the business relationships can work very, very simply because you just trust each other. You know it'll work out. Uh, for example, there's another angel in Silicon Valley, uh, Ila Gill, who I like to do deals with. And the reason I love working with Ila is because I know that when the deal is being done, he will bend over backwards to give me extra. He will always round off in my favor if there's an extra dollar being delivered here or there. If there's some cost to pay, uh, he'll pay it out of his own pocket and he won't even mention it to me. And because he goes so far out of his way to treat me so well, I send him every deal that I have. I try and include him in everything. And then I go out of my way to try and pay for him. Uh, so that relationship just ends up so powerful that the one plus one is more than two as investors here. Um, so compounding in those relationships is, is very valuable. Even like fitness and health, uh, many of you have probably been on various diets and nutrition programs and exercise programs. And you probably notice that it takes a little while before you kind of go through these growth spurts. And then once you've gone through a spurt, you kind of land at a new level, either you're thinner or you're more muscular, and then you can jump up to the next level from there. Uh, obviously fitness, we're talking about physiological Compound interest is not going to work anywhere near as strongly as it will in the purely intellectual domain. But in the intellectual domain, compound interest rules. Um, even when you look at a business, a business that may have 
a hundred users, but it's growing at a compound rate of 20% a month, will very, very quickly stack up to having millions of users. And sometimes even the founders of the companies are surprised by how large the business scales. So when you find the right thing to do, when you find the right people to work with, then just investing deeply into that and sticking with it for decades is really how you make the big bucks and you make the big returns in your relationships and in your money. So compound interest, very important. Actually, am I high? No, I'm not high, but guess what? You're blocked. So sorry, I'm tossing out people who are just throwing in sleep comments. How does one escape nine to five? Um, so uh, escaping the nine to five grind is actually very difficult. Uh, and one of the big problems that many of us have in life, and I faced this early on too, is you, you just get sucked into being busy. And you get sucked into being busy because you have a job. The job kind of chews up all of your time from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You get home, you're exhausted. How are you supposed to work on anything else? So, uh, I think the key there is trying to find a career or a job or an education where you will end up in a business where the inputs and the outputs are disconnected. But what I mean by that is, um, let's say that you were growing up in uh, you know, the world 2000 years ago, almost all the jobs you could have back then, the inputs and the outputs are very tightly connected. So if you go and you uh, you know, you have to go cut wood, you spend four hours cutting woods, you get four hours worth of cutting wood output. Uh, there'll be a very slight difference between the two. Um, but nowadays you have knowledge worker jobs, you have intellectual jobs, uh, programming being my favorite example, where a good developer can write a piece of code that can literally make your business hundreds of millions of dollars over the next few years. And there are developers who can, who can write code all day long uh, and, you know, just because they're creating the wrong thing, it's actually not creating value no matter how hard they work. So, yeah, customers don't care about inputs. They only care about outcomes and outputs. So if you can, if you can navigate towards a career where you're tracked on the output, uh, you're going to do much better. What are examples of careers? So I gave coding as an example, but actually sales is another one of those examples, and especially very expensive sales, uh, very high-end sales. Uh, so, like, if you're out there... Uh, for example, if you're selling houses, if you're a real estate agent, right? Not a great job necessarily, very, very crowded. But if you're a top flight real estate agent, you know how to market yourself, you know how to sell houses, it's possible you could sell $5 million mansions in a tenth the time that somebody else is struggling to sell $100,000 apartments or condos. Um, so that is a job where input and output are highly disconnected. Um, coding and sales, what else? Well, actually building any product and selling any product. And fundamentally, what else is there? So what you don't necessarily want to be in is a, uh, a support role, like a customer service kind of role. For example, customer service, unfortunately, um, inputs and outputs map relatively closely towards each other. The amount of hours put in matters. Um, so it helps to move towards things that have these uh, skill sets where it's very hard to match inputs to outputs. So it's a little hard to pay attention with all the different questions going by, but I'm going to, I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to scan the questions. I'm going to try and look for themes. One question of the 7 billion people, can everyone do this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every seven, every one of 7 billion people in the world uh, can do something interesting and different and productized. Let me give you a thought experiment. Okay. Here's a thought experiment. I, I want you to seriously think about this. Don't just take my word for it. But assume that everyone in the world had uh, maximum practical knowledge. Um, like everyone could be could go create hardware and robots. Everyone could go write code. Uh, everyone could go and invest money. Everyone could do mathematics. So if we were all maximally educated, then what would happen? Uh, I think within five years, uh, robots would be doing all of the manual labor. Uh, we would all be doing creative work uh, and we would essentially all be wealthy. Um, we would have figured out how to program machines and use technology to do everything that we need to do other than the creative work. 
And so at that point, we would be either furthering science and technology and inventing brand new things, or we would be doing creative work for each other. There are a small number of true zero-sum games in the world. Uh, status, you know, all the status games are, are zero-sum. But most of the things that we care about when we talk about wealth, like cars and houses and clean water and air travel and all of those things, those are not zero-sum games. Those are positive-sum games. Uh, you can get really, really, really far with automation. So I do think it's possible for 7 billion people to have 7 billion products. Remember, we used to live in an age where almost everybody was farmers. Uh, and there was a time when it was unimaginable that there would be a class of people who did anything other than farming, except for a very, very thin layer of society. And now farmers are like 1% of the developed world. So obviously we've left that behind. And we have already started to move much larger numbers of people into creative professions. Yeah, someone mentioned Nassim Taleb's Skin in the Game. That is the best book I read in 2018. Uh, I highly recommend it for everybody. It's got lots and lots of great ideas in there, uh, lots of good mental models and constructs. Uh, Nassim isn't the easy, he has a he has a bit of an attitude, but he has that because he's brilliant uh, and it's okay. So just look past that and read the book, learn the concepts. Uh, Taleb Skin of the Game is, is one of the best business books I've ever read. And luckily it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't masquerade uh, as a business book. Skin in the Game is the name of the book, Skin in the Game. Yeah, so learning to sell, let's talk about sales skills because this goes into specific knowledge. Um, sales skills are a form of specific knowledge. Really good salespeople, I think it, you can be trained. So it's not to say you can't learn it, uh, but really there's such a thing as a natural in sales uh, and you run into them all the time in the industry that I'm in. And when you meet someone who is a natural at sales, you just know that they're amazing and they're really good at what they do. Uh, that is a form of specific knowledge. Now, obviously they learned that somewhere, but they didn't learn that in a classroom setting. They learned that probably in their childhood, in a schoolyard, they learned it negotiating with their parents, maybe some of his genetic component in their DNA. Um, so, and you can improve it. You can read Robert Caldini, you can go to a sales training seminar, you can do door-to-door -door sales, which is brutal, but will train you very quickly. Um, so you can definitely improve your sales skills, sales skills, but a lot of sales is this specific knowledge that you learn just by doing, especially at a very early age. So when I talk about specific knowledge, I talk about what I'm basically saying is figure out what is it that you were doing as a kid or as a teenager, almost effortlessly, that you didn't even consider a skill, but people around you notice like your mother would know, your best friend growing up would know. And it, uh, to give you examples of what it could be, it could be sales skills, it could be that you were just musically talented and you just had the ability to pick up any instrument. Uh, it could be that you had an obsessive personality, so you would dive into things and learn them very quickly. It could be that you had a love for science fiction, so you were into sci-fi, you were into reading, which means that you can absorb lots of knowledge very quickly. It could have been uh, you were playing a lot of games, so you actually understand game theory pretty well. Uh, it could even be you know you were out there gossiping and digging into your friend network, and that might make you into a very interesting kind of journalist. But uh, a specific knowledge is sort of this weird combination of unique traits from your DNA combined with your unique upbringing and your response to it. Uh, and it's almost baked into your personality and your identity. And then you can hone it. So for example, I love to read and I love technology. So I learn very, very quickly and I get bored fast, just like one of the commentators mentioned, I have that same issue. So if I had gone into a profession that required me to tunnel down for 20 years into the same topic, it wouldn't work. But because I'm in venture investing, which requires me to come up to speed very, very quickly on new technologies, and it kind of rewards getting bored because there's all the new technology coming along to evaluate, it, it matches up pretty well with my specific knowledge and skill sets. People are talking about uh, Robert Caldini. Robert Caldini wrote a book uh, called um, Influence. And Influence is a book on persuasion. Uh, it is one of the best 
books, uh, one of the best business and skill books ever written. Uh, and I can recommend it for everybody who's listening to this to read it. Uh, what Caldini talks about is how you persuade people, how you convince people to do things. What are the tricks? What are the strategies? And it turns out that most of these strategies work really well even if you know that they're being used on you, they're that good because we as hum humans are emotionally and behaviorally hardwired through evolution to fall for these strategies. And uh, the book is called Influence by Robert Cialdini, C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. -I -I. And the key takeaway in Cialdini is CLASS R, C-L-A-S-S-R. That's an acronym and it stands for uh, how you persuade people. The C is consistency. People want to be consistent with their past actions. So if they did something before, then they kind of wrap that into their identity and they want to be consistent and do that kind of action again. So example, uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin used to have this trick where if he wanted someone who didn't like him, if he had an, a social enemy, he would go to them and he would ask them to borrow a book. And it was kind of awkward because especially back when he was alive, books were rare, uh, books were expensive and books were things to be treasured. But at the same time, you always wanted to teach people. So he would say, let me borrow a book from you. And if somebody said, sure, uh, you know, here's the book and they were his enemy, they feel a little awkward and they loan him the book. Then later, when he came back and returned the book and was nice to them again, they would, they would think, well, I loaned him the book in the past Therefore, I, I, I wouldn't loan a book to someone I didn't like. Therefore, I must like him. So just to be consistent with their past action, they would like him more. So that's how consistency works. Liking is obvious. That's an L in class R. That if somebody likes you, they're more likely to be persuaded by you. So just be nice to them. Uh, a is for authority. So, for example, you're more likely to listen to a doctor about medical advice than you are about a non-doctor. So that's where you have the infomercial saying, you know, recommended by X dentists or Y doctors. Um, and the S, the next S is scarcity, which is, you know, there's only a few of these left. It's disappearing. Grab it fast now. It's like the used car salesman saying, this is the last one I have left in the lot. Um, the second S stands for social proof which is monkey see, monkey do. Um, so when, uh, you know, if you see your friends doing something, then you'll do it. The simplest example of this is just go stand on the street and start looking up and pretty soon other people around you will all be looking up. Uh, and then R is reciprocity, which is people always want to repay you and sometimes they can't do the math on what things are worth. So for example, the Hare Krishnas in the airport will come up to you and they'll give you uh, you know, uh, they'll give you a, a flower or they'll give you like a copy of the Bhagavad Gita and then they'll ask for a donation. Uh, and the donation is often like out of proportion to what the book was worth. So that's kind of the code that Cialdini gets to his book, Class R. It's kind of what you need to remember. Uh, Scott Adams has a great blog where he goes in much more detail about more modern techniques of persuasion, including ones that uh, Trump uses, such as linguistic kill shots and assuming the sale uh, uh, and, uh, you know, anchoring in negotiations and so on. So I think persuasion is one of those foundational skills that everybody should learn, at least the basic theories around it. And Robert Caldini and Scott Adams' blogs are probably the two places that I would start. I'm going to wait till a few more questions go by. Otherwise, I'll go back to my uh, covering the tweet storm. I, I, one thing I don't want to do this time around, which I think I've done in previous Periscopes, if I've answered lots of uh, random one-off questions, and uh, I'm not sure it appeals to everybody. Um, I'm drinking tea, by the way. What other foundational skills are there in addition to persuasion? I think basic mathematics is really underrated. Uh, so if you're going to make money, if you're going to invest money, your basic math should be really good. You don't need to learn geometry or trigonometry or calculus or any of that stuff. Not if you're just going into business, but arithmetic, probability and statistics, those are extremely important. Um, crack open a basic math book, just make sure you're really good at multiplying, dividing, compounding, uh, you know, manipulating numbers. 
uh, and probability and statistics, very, very important. And there's a new branch of probability and statistics, which is really around uh, tail events, black swans, extreme probabilities. Uh, and again, I have to refer back to uh, Nassim Taleb, who I think is one of the greatest philosopher scientists of our times. And he's really done a lot of pioneering work on this. Um, you can also read about it through complexity theory. Uh, but uh, complexity theory and sort of the the uh, the mathematics of complex uh, of, of complex events and chaotic events, uh, I think, is really important. Uh, basic accounting is also helpful, although you don't need to get a degree in accounting. And frankly, accounting is really boring. The good news is most of accounting turns out to be common sense. Calculus is is useful to know to understand rates of change and how nature works but it's sort of more important to understand the principles of calculus where you're measuring the change in small discrete uh, or small continuous events uh, rather than uh, it's important that you be able to solve integrals or do derivations uh, on demand because you're not, you're not going to need to do that in the business world. Frankly, once you're done with probability statistics and basic arithmetic, the most you're going to need to know is how, how to manipulate Excel. Is programming becoming a commodity skill? No. By definition, programming cannot be a commodity skill. I know there are a lot of people, usually people who aren't programmers, who say, well, in the future, computers will write code. No, they won't. Uh, the coding is a general AI task. It is basically taking something, uh, a, a construct in your brain, constructing a logical construct, doing something very, very creative, and then having it solve intellectual problems or, or repeat solutions to previously solved intellectual problems. Coding is very difficult. And you can see that the top, top coders in the world, people like Notch who made Minecraft or Satoshi Nakamoto or John Carmack, these people can literally make billions of dollars of value while someone who's sort of a not very good coder uh, can literally just create no value. So the spread is so large and that tells you that it's a creative task. It's just like the Mona Lisa is a much better painting than anything I can throw together in an afternoon. Uh, and it's much better by an almost infinite amount. So when you see that kind of variation in outcomes, uh, that tells you that that job is highly creative and is not likely to be automated in our lifetimes. If it does get automated, it will be through a general AI and the moment there's a general AI, this whole game is over. We have nothing left to talk about because everything changes. What would I major in today? That is a good question if I were to go to college today. So I'm actually not a huge fan of the current university system, uh, at least in terms of the cost that it imposes on you, both in terms of opportunity cost uh, as well as in financial cost. Uh, in exchange, you get credentialing, you get an alumni network, but you've spent four years of your life and an enormous amount of money. So if you are going to go to the university, then the first rule is learn things that you can't learn by yourself. Uh, because uh, most things you can learn by yourself at home. When I went to university, uh, I started out doing English and history. Actually, originally I was physics. Um, that's a long story. But then I switched to English and history. My grades were fantastic. It was really easy. They told me I should be an English professor. Reality is that stuff that I could have done for fun. I could have read those books in my spare time. So there's no need to go to school for that. If you're going to go to school, learn something you can't learn on your own. For most people, that's mathematics, programming, physics. It's, it's the STEM disciplines. Uh, it's having access to the tools and the people and the rigor and the discipline and the exercises to go ahead and do that. Now, if you are at the level where you can learn STEM disciplines on your own, then you may not need to go to a university. The, then the remaining reasons for you to go to a university are the alumni network plus the credentialing. And credentialing, at least in the programming environment, you can get on your own to some extent. Um, alumni network, it would be a little harder to build, but if you can get a good internship or a good job, you might just want to drop right into that. But obviously that only applies for exceptional people. Yeah, for medicine also, you can't get like high quality medical training on your own in your backyard. Um, so you would have to go to school for that. So it's, it's a fairly narrow set of things. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't need to go to school. To like I love philosophy. Half the books I'm reading at any given time are essentially philosophy books, but uh, I'm not, uh, I, I wouldn't go to school for philosophy. I didn't study philosophy in school. What about art school for designers? 
Uh, it's hard to say. I'm not a designer myself, uh, nor do I, nor am I very artistic uh, outside of manipulating words. But at least from my faraway sense, is that a truly great artist or designer doesn't actually need to go to school. Uh, but that only applies for the top 1%. And you probably have to be self aware enough to know if you're in that top 1% truly or not. Probably, if you're asking the question, you should go to school. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Yeah, so I think now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to uh, the tweet storm. And I'm going to go through a couple of things that I didn't actually tweet out. Yeah, so one one thing that, that, that I think is important to keep in mind is that um, we all have many, many desires in life. There's lots of things we want to do. We want to be fit. We want to be healthy. We want to be happy. We want to be rich. We want to be with our, uh, you know, with the perfect mate. Um, the problem is you, you, when your desires are that split up, what you're doing is you're creating massive amounts of anxiety. Uh, you're losing your focus. Um, so what you really want to do is you want to pick the one thing you care about more than anything else and you want to ignore everything else. You want to ignore everything else in a rational way because otherwise you'll never have peace of mind. Uh, 